welcome to today's talk by Shireen Ebadi, sponsored by the Central Asia Working Group under the auspices of the Institute of East Asian Studies at UC Berkeley. Now, this is an initiative that aims to bring Central Asia into focus by fostering campus-wide dialogue between faculty, visiting scholars, and graduate students working on the region. Now, usually informal seminars at noon are followed by a public talk, uh, like today. So Berkeley affiliates, uh, affiliates who are interested in the informal seminars feel free to reach out to the program via the IAS website. Now, before introducing our speaker today, I just wanted to mention that you can type in your questions by clicking on the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window, and I will try to get to as many of them as possible. For those experiencing technical issues, please use the chat box at the bottom, and that will uh, put you in touch with uh, our um, assistant today who's managing uh, the webinar for the Central Asia Working Group. All right, so our speaker, uh, Shireen Ebadi. Let's see if I can get her to pop up. Shireen Ebadi received her BS in biology from the University of California at Santa Cruz and is currently a PhD student in the Department of Geography with a designated emphasis in critical theory. Her work addresses the confluence of communist movements and political Islam from the Cold War to the present. She focuses on contemporary efforts at uh, democratization carried out by Islamic feminists based in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Now, with a particular focus on Afghanistan and the United States, she is interested in upholding the centrality of race, gender, landscape, political economy, and spirituality to any understandings of conflict and liberation. Currently, she's conducting her dissertation research on political movements across the Afghan diaspora, focusing on the aftermath on, of the war on terror in shaping the migrations of Afghans and its effects on the ways religion and politics are reformulated. Now, her research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, Fulbright Hayes, FLAS, the UC Consortium for Black Studies, and the UC Berkeley Chancellor's Fellowship. And today she's with us to speak on Afghan feminism and the politics of freedom. Thanks for joining us today, Shireen. We would now have applause, but unfortunately <laughs> with the webinar form format, that's not possible. Go ahead. Same. So first and foremost, um, I wanna thank Sanja and Frank um, for having me here and for all of their work in bringing together the speaker series. Um, the intellectual community too of the Central Asian Working Group has been very special to get to know. Um, and it's been a joy and an honor to be in conversation with so many other scholars that are working on such a variety of topics in Central Asia. Um, so my talk today uh, is about Afghan leftist political movements and especially their feminist movements. Um, but you'll notice that the talk doesn't really fit into neat geographical categories. Um, it challenges what we think of typical Central Asian studies. And in the case of Afghanistan, as I'm sure we all know, this has to do with the vast diaspora that's important in the formation of nationalist politics. Um, extremely important, just as important as those political movements that originate within the country itself. So this component of diasporic identity and networks is especially important to the whole region of Central and even South Asia, and already pushes up against the ways the region has been historically conceptualized as a coherent and cohesive place and object of, of study. With this in mind and this disposition towards unsettling concepts, and especially those concepts we might take as the most given or foundational, I'm excited to share with you what I've prepared for today. I'm always struck by how many different responses are evoked when discussing a powerful and shocking video of a woman who's only 24 years old and the youngest elected member of parliament from Afghanistan's Farah province about a thousand kilometers west of Kabul, near the border of Iran. The woman's name is Malalai Joya, and the video takes place in 2003, 
only two years after the US invaded Afghanistan in 2001. And here I say only two years because 19 and counting years later, the war on Afghanistan and the ever expanding war on terror is now America's longest war. Boloya Jerga, held in Kabul in December 2003, was about the time that the US had declared victory on the Taliban for the first time and had recently instated the administration of President Hamid Karzai, who would hold power in the country for the next 10 years. Karzai, an Afghan born politician, had strong links to NATO and other Western allies. And before his appointment as president of the hastily created Republic of Afghanistan, hardly anyone had heard of him. But in an attempt to formulate a democratic national republic, Afghan style, the proto but not yet nation state held a loyajerga, what in name references the Afghan tradition of regional and communal meetings and what would now bring together 500 elected parliamentarians from the diaspora and nomadic populations, as well as 64 seats for women elected from Afghanistan's 32 provinces. On that day in December 2003, Malalai Joya stepped onto the podium in front of the delegation. She was allowed three minutes to speak. I'm going to, um, due to audio concerns, I'm going to actually um, stop sharing and show you the video from YouTube. So here's the video. <laughs> میگه جای دور آمدیم از شما تحریال محکم از چند دفعه که به ما وقت به جوان ها وقت ندادن و میخواید سه دقیقه یه نه سه دقیقه برای تو فقلاده وقت میتیم بفرمه اسم الله ملاله جویا از ملایت فراستم البته به اجازه حاضرین محترم به نام خدا به نام شهدای گرگور کفن رای آزادی وطن میخوایم چند لحظه صحبت کنم من انتقاد مثل تمام وطن دارای ما که رایی جنزور داره به ایست که چرا میمانند که مشروعیت و قانونیت بودن ایلوی جرگه زیر سوال بره تا وجود او جنایت کارهایی که کشور ما را به این حالت رسانده یا کسایی بودن که کشور ما را میناخت جنگ های ملی و بین المللی ساختن زن سکیز ترین کسا بودن در جامعه که میخواستن که کشور ما را به این حالت رسانده یا باید محاکمه بین المللی و ملی شوند یا مردم ما اگر ببخشه مردم پا بر so after a minute, her microphone was cut off and the room exploded into chaos. Unsurprisingly, she was whisked off to a secure location, a hotel in Kabul, where she was protected by security guards of the Afghan army, whom she specifically asked to be members of the Afghan National Guard rather than the Amer American security detail that she had been offered. And the opposition to her speech, and especially among religious and regional leaders and warlords, is pertinent to her activism and to Afghan nationalism. You might have also noticed her words garnered applause more than once from many in the delegation. Malalai Joya herself is clearly an exceptional figure. However, she's one voice among a contingent of Afghan political movements which advocate on socialist and communist platforms. One of the most well-known of these platforms is Rawa, the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan. Campaigning for secular democracy and socialist reform, Rawa is often at the heart of controversy, both within the context of Afghan politics and in their high profile relationships with Western feminists. I'll return to this in a little bit too. Rawa is an organization that carries with it a certain air of intrigue and mystery. It wouldn't be too far of a stretch to imagine its members as feminist protagonists of the most hardened female spy movies, having gained tactical knowledge under the Soviet and the Taliban regimes, and of course the current American occupation. The organization itself is run entirely underground. This means that the identities of its members are protected. Not only do they talk to the press and on speaking engagements on conditions of anonymity, their identities are actively hidden one's affiliation with Rawa is only ever speculative. Even still, they have received international attention as highly vocal and polarizing critics of the US occupation. And it goes without saying the previous Soviet occupation, the foreign backed Mujahideen, the Taliban regime, 
the Northern Alliance that formed in the retreat of the Mujahideen and also after the rise of fundamentalism and Pashtun nationalism that we see under the Taliban. Another group that could not do without mentioning is Hambastagi. So while Rawa was in its beginnings, um, Rawa, the group, actually um, actively took part in political campaigns and ran publications with the aim of feminist propagandizing. Through the years, Rawa's work has been reoriented towards more humanitarian campaigns while still maintaining the imperative of radical and unfortunately in the case of Afghanistan, we have to clarify leftist radicalizing um, of radicalizing Afghan youth through secret Rawa schools and covert education initiatives. Hambastagi, on the other hand, roughly translating to the Solidarity Party of Afghanistan, is a political party whose candidates run on the Afghan national ticket every five-year election cycle. While the party is far less visible than Rawa in the eyes of its Western counterparts, it's the most widely supported party among the Afghan left. Its political campaigns garner large amounts of popular support, though never enough to match the heavily favored American-backed presidential candidates. Hambastagi also received significant support across the diaspora, which is no small fact, given members of Afghanistan dias Afghanistan's diaspora are granted full voting rights and may even hold political office regardless of residency status. Likewise, or like Rawa, Hambastagi organizing tends to run in more or less secret networks. While political candidates themselves are public figures, much of Hambastagi's political activities are covert. This stems from a dual aspect of communism's legacy in, this, in Central Asia. On one hand, activists harbor not entirely unwarranted fears of American and Western suppression. On the other hand, the fraught social reforms of Soviet communism, such as industrialization and land reform, makes many Afghans weary. For this reason, Hambastagi's leftism is aimed less at what we might think of as a typical communist agenda, and much more at secular statehood and a feminist agenda. So here we have three political figures, all representing and articulating a certain type of Afghan leftism. But beyond the images of resistance that each of these figures might represent in popular Western media, I hope to offer by the end of this talk a, re a reflection back into the coherence and limits of the political concepts and the intellectual tools we use in scholarship and knowledge making practices. At least for the purposes of this talk, I'm not interested in setting up oppositions where there may be none. Furthermore, this talk is not only about Afghan political movements. It's about what happens when the vocabularies we presume to recognize and the political categories that structure our everyday lives become unfamiliar and stretched beyond limits of possibility. One of the primary questions I ask in my research and pose throughout this talk is this, what happens when religion is not used in political movements in the ways we've come to think and to expect? And while this is not a story about Trumpism, Bolsonaro, Marine Le Pen, Brexit, or many of the other rising tides of right-wing nationalism and neo-fascism, Still, it's important, the erosion of truth, of fact, of rationality from politics are absolutely important and relevant to the directions in which our collective political futures might travel. My research draws across literatures of post-colonialism, liberalism, and feminist theory, and uses rhetoric of the Afghan left as a means to explore the implications of radical political imaginaries on liberal universalizing frameworks. The urgency of this work emerges from a geopolitical context that has borne witness to a steady rise in the prominence of illiberal, illiberal populisms. Where might we find ourselves given the failure of liberalism's central tenets of freedom and democracy to quiet these radical aspirations? So in our current global political context, we're confronted with this paradox. In the case of right-wing populism, as I mentioned above, liberalism is being challenged from within the very heart of where we might imagine it to most flourish. And in the case of Rawa, Ambassagi, and Malalai Joya, we have some of liberalism's staunchest supporters 
from where we might imagine a regressive and fundamentalist traditionalism to most flourish. Keeping this paradox in mind, I'll turn to some of the scholars who inform my thinking in this regards. I'm going to speak a lot about liberalism um, and especially about secularism um, uh, under liberalism. And this focus on liberalism, I believe, is warranted by the fact that liberalism is an expansive word that's not only pertinent to our daily existences, but is used to signify many things to many different people. So I'll clarify that when I'm speaking of liberalism, I'm referring to a set of political formations, democracy, balance of power, elected government, a constitution, and the idea of a nation state, borders, and citizens. I'm also referring to liberalism as ways of organizing life. In this case, secularism is important, recognized by most as the political ideology of the separation between church and state, and in social theory known as the confinement of religion to the public sphere. A famous example of this is actually the case of France and the controversial ban of women and girls to wear hijab while attending public schools. And finally, I'll refer to li liberalism as an idea of rights, like the right to vote, the right to own property, the right to marry, or freedom of speech. We even have a universal declaration of human rights in organizations such as the United Nations that authorize a transcendent and international sovereignty, sovereignty and enact political and humanitarian interventions in the name of human rights. One theorist, who helps me think about the political concepts of liberalism and their enactment in everyday life is the anthropologist Talal Assad. On a conceptual level, Assad's work addresses the possibilities and problems of critique as a theoretical disposition. As an anthropologist, geographer, political theorist, or really anyone using ethnographic methods, this also poses the problem of how critique travels across cultures. And I'm putting cultures in quotes so as not to offend the anthropologists in the room. While Assad's work is vast, in the interest of time, I'll stick closely to the concept of secularism as a central theme in understanding the political movements I brought up earlier and will return to in a little bit. Through secularism, Assad brings to the foreground what happens when liberal political formations encounter their outsides. The way in which Assad understands political and social life under liberalism is reminiscent of the ways that Foucault conceptualizes governmentality. Secularism enacted through governance compels a normatively disembodied and compartmentalized individual between the realm of the public and the private. In this secular governance, religion is redefined, not as an encompassing cosmology, but as an irrational aspect that must be confined to the private sphere for the public good. The condition of secularism, this condition of secularism is famously explored by Saba Mahmoud's work, beginning with her book titled The Politics of Piety. Yeah, for the interest of time, I'm gonna um, try and get through some of the theoretical stuff. So however, Assad's secular governance dif differs from Foucault and that he studies it from the counterpoint of an outside, that outside being society structured through Islamic worldviews. For Assad, liberalism's lineage is undeniably Christian and reformist. Islamic governance, on the other hand, like Sharia law, like liberalism, and, and Sharia law, like liberalism, authorizes modes of life ideas of rights, and also normalizes an internal disposition, albeit one of, appro of approaching perfection through pious practices of alignment towards God's will. Islam is a political and a social doctrine. It is inherent. It's even universal, but it's not essential. It is a way of living religion that runs counter to how liberalism makes sense of religion. Secularism is also recognized in political systems other than liberalism. It's a foundational component of Marxist communism, which is especially relevant to Central Asia. And it's hard to talk of Central Asia without considering the centrality of the Cold War to its history and present construction. The embeddedness of Islam in many of the countries of Central Asia posed an intractable front to communism and Soviet expansionism. The question of how to incorporate 
deeply religious societies into the agenda of the common turn, the international communist movement, was the source of many internal fractures within Soviet leadership and played no small part in its dismantling and demise. In light of this history, it's no wonder Islam has been so much studied as a counterpiece and reflection into the limits and fallacies of liberalism. When speaking of Central Asia and Afghanistan, there's a specter in the room or an elephant in the room, depending on if you're a Marxist, and that is colonialism. Cold War colonialism is not the mercantilist commodity-based capitalism so famously embodied in the case of British India. Instead, it was a social and ideological expansionism based on territory and the rise of an internationalist Soviet empire. While Cold War colonialism is much less the object of study in the canon of post-colonial theory, the relevance of post-colonialism to Afghanistan and Central Asia is not something that can be undermined or overlooked. In many ways, Soviet colonialism during the Cold War ushered in a new kind of colonialism based on ideological expansionism rather than ter territorial con conquest. But even still, it was no less hegemonic and the historical antecedents of contemporary American empire can still be seen in it today. Alongside two ever expanding forms of internationalism during the Cold War, that of American free market liberalism and Soviet state led communism was the non-aligned movement. The Bandung Conference held in April 1955 in Bandung in Indonesia was one of the first moments of collectivizing a post-colonial consciousness. Bringing together leaders from 29 countries across Asia and Africa, it attracted highly influential attendees from Nehru to Nasser and served as a meeting grounds for the intellectual canon of post-colonial theory. Equally important to the fame and attention generated by the conference was a list from whom delegates were not invited. This included the United States, Israel, the Soviet Union, and European nations with the exception of Turkey. In speaking of the Bandung Conference, I'm tracing the work of Vijay Prashad in particular in The Darker Nations, who argues that far from being a marked geographical place, the third world was a project that always required active remaking. The third world was a concept driven by the common experience of powerlessness at the hands of political and economic exploitation. The Bandung Conference also gathered noteworthy figures such as Richard White and, dis and discussions centered heavily on the civil rights movement in the United States, its shortcomings and its failed promises of racial equity. This expanded even further the conditions encompassing colonialism and post-colonialism as both global and local phenomena. And in fact, the, the conference actively sought to dehomogenize and challenge internalist narratives of nationhood as the pinnacle of post-colonial independence. Participants and attendees of the Bandung Conference, which included Deputy Prime Minister Sardar Mohammed Naim of the Kingdom of Afghanistan, articulated visions of an internationalist nationalism. The aim of this internationalist nationalism ran counter to the ways in which self-determination could also produce isolation and vulnerability in David and Goliath battles against the political and economic domination of the former metropoles. Internationalist nationalism also allowed the newly emergent nation states to assert a united front and agenda of anti-racism, women's empowerment, anti-militarism and nuclear disarmament on a world stage. In reality, the, the solidarities of the Bandung Conference were cohesive by concept, but this did not always translate to cohesion in practice. Operating on a consensus basis, it was no less easy to incorporate the political and social differences among post-colonial contexts than it had for colon the colonial powers who had hoped opening up more mutual relationships with the colony's leaders might help them retain their political domination. It's also important to note that while Bandung was the first instance 
of bringing together leaders under the umbrella of empowered post-colonialism, the scope and influence of the conference was immense. In its aftermath, leftist and communist movements proliferated. Furthermore, the shared sense of post-colonial identity developed through the conference remains extremely relevant as we know today. It provided a framework that stitched together localized resistance and global solidarity under the banner of anti-imperialism and anti-oppression of all kinds. From the Black Panthers in Oakland, to Castro's Cuba, to Afghanistan's various leftist political parties, including but not limited to Rawa, the component of transnational solidarity through material political networks fostered through the Bandung Conference was foundational to the rise and prominence of leftism, both within Afghanistan, across Central Asia, and far beyond. With some of the historical antecedents of contemporary Afghanistan set, I'll mention only briefly here the war on terror, though it's a huge topic worthy of a talk in its own right. Then I'll return to the political movements, especially of Rawa, before bringing this all together in a conclusion. The war on terror is an extremely loaded term. Tactically, it refers to everything from a set of practices of overt warfare to proxy militarism and covert persuasion through ideological and material support and oppression of political regimes, all in the interest of maintaining political ties deemed friendly to North American interests. Not unlike the Cold War, the war on terror is undergirded by a set of opposing political discourses. It's through the war on terror that we see one of the most heated displays of liberalism opposing its illiberal counterpoints, particularly political Islam, which is the primary focus of this talk. However, Islam is far from the only antagonist in the war on terror. The rise and predominance of religious fundamentalism across the post-colonial world, I would argue, um, should be understood as a Cold War aftermath. Religious fundamentalism is hardly a spontaneous contingency of events. Without delving too far into the vast literature, we can already see the roots of Islamic radicalism, even in the very foundations of the post-colonial world. It em emerges out of the anti-hegemony of newly independent nation states, or in other words, from the same grounds of what I'm arguing gave rise to a thriving secular left in Afghanistan and beyond. Scholarship on the war on terror gives us a certain architecture for understanding the development and the pro pro proliferation of political movements, the changing and increasingly more deadly instruments of modern warfare and the social consequences that follow in the wake of all of this. But ironically, scholarship on the war on terror has given far less attention to Afghanistan and its diaspora, despite being at the heart of the war itself and its discourses. Even less research has considered the predominance and proliferation of leftist and moderate political voices, aiming instead to expose militarism and hegemony eliding the fact that many aspirant and viable nationalist movements that are, e that are neither imperialist nor fundamentalist can be found in the very places we, presu we presume to be most helpless and war-torn. I'll return back to Rawa as it's one of the most vocal and well-known figures, especially on the international stage and across English speaking audiences. But it's important and I want to emphasize that all of these political platforms I've mentioned thus far support a secular, feminist, and anti-imperial agenda. Additionally, while I haven't focused much on their differences, each of these platforms are not the same. They're all born out of differing relationships to communism, differing relationships to imperialism, and to feminism. Some garner more support from the diaspora, while others garner more support from their, um, from their, uh, sorry, from their participation with Western political groups. It's worth pausing a moment to reflect on the formation and duration of Rawa in Afghanistan's political trajectory. Founded in 1997 by the 20-year-old Mina Kishbar Kamal at Kabul University, 
Rawa was created in order to develop a socialist feminist political agenda in Afghanistan in opposition to the sway and influence of the Soviet Union in the Afghan government. I'm gonna skip ahead to a few, yeah, this slide. Since Rawa advocated for socialism without Soviet imperialism, the organization from its very beginnings was caught up in rumors of propagating Maoism. In the aftermath of the violence and famines associated with Maoist movements, these rumors were at first dismissed and eventually vehemently denied, although they still circulate. In its beginnings, Rawa focused on running a bilingual propaganda publication called Payame San, or Women's Message, and building momentum for its political agenda. But through the 1990s and early 2000s, Rawa became a vocal critic critic of the Taliban government and the later US invasion. Rawa gained significant attention in the international spotlight due to its heated and hardline political statements and the way that it articulated its views. Famously, a Rawa representative appeared on Oprah, unveiling herself according to the Western fetish and highlighting the plight of Afghan women. It also formed alliances with several prominent Western feminists such as Cynthia Enloe and briefly collaborated with the Feminist Majority Foundation, which I'll highlight here. The status and tenor of these relationships is constantly shifting though, as Rawa receives a lot of criticism for having an unpalatably anti-Western stance and due to its prominence across the West. It's a controversial political voice amongst Afghans themselves. So Rawa and the Feminist Majority Foundation. Rawa and the Feminist Majority Foundation began their collaborations publicly in the mid 1990s. With the feminist majority claiming to be the first feminist coalition to highlight the struggles of Afghan women under the Taliban government, naturally the feminist, major uh, feminist majority re received copious amounts of its political information from Rawa, who also benefited from the alliance as the feminist majority sponsored Rawa on a speaking tour throughout the United States, which brought them to a lot of international fame, and then later sponsored them to attend conferences and gatherings of transnational feminists across North America and Europe. So a lot of Rawa's um, international fame and, um, and prominence in kind of dialogues of what we would term quote Western or even transnational feminism comes from this collaboration with an extremely um, salient feminist organization, the feminist majority. However, by the early 2000s, the relationship between Rawa and the feminist majority fractured dramatically on the public stage. Angered by an 11 page spread in the feminist majority's publication, Miss Magazine, Rawa accused the feminist majority of appropriating its political work and social mission as yet another instance of Western failures to center and empower Afghan feminists in their own terms. I'm gonna read just a, a little quote that comes from this, um, this three page spread. While the, this is Rawa speaking, a Rawa, Rawa representative. While the feminist majority does deserve credit for their early recognition relative to others in the US of the dangers to Afghan women under the Taliban and for their actions to educate US women and to intervene in US politics and policy, this article would suggest this, this 11 page spread that I referenced, that they, other Western women and a handful of expatriate Afghan women have single-handedly freed the women of Afghanistan from an oppression that started and ended with the Taliban. What's missing from this telling of the feminist majority story in quotes is any credit to the independent Afghan women who stayed in Afghanistan and Pakistan through the 23 year and counting crisis in Afghanistan and provided relief, education, resistance and hope to the women and men of their country. Now, I will say this was published in the early 2000s. So it's been much more than 23 years now. Kind of skipping ahead, this is the, this is the accusation. Um, or worse, the feminist majority cannot stand to share the credit with this independent organization being Rawa which while appreciative of the support of their non-Afghan sisters and their Afghan and non-Afghan brothers, 
has never acted in the name of any other organization nor allowed outsiders to steer their course. What I find particularly noteworthy in this exchange is the stance of contradiction that we find in Rawa and its subjects. This is something we talked a little bit about in the informal chat but, um, at noon. The openness to collaborations and the political aspirations of freedom that feminism represents to many within Afghanistan and across its diaspora. And at the same time, Rawa maintains a staunch rejection of the notes of imperialism found in mainstream nationalist and feminist discourse, transnationalist and feminist discourse. Counter to Spivak um, in her famous formulation, Rawa is not a story of brown women saved from brown men by white women. Rawa is so steeped in its discourses of secularism and feminism that it relegates the identity category of Muslim largely to the public sphere, private sphere, at least in its encounters with Western political organizations. But this is a disp disposition that changes entirely with context, for in its covert operations and secret schools, leftist radicalization is developed alongside a fiercely feminist vision of what it means to be a Muslim girl, while still challenging what the proper disposition of a radical Muslim women, woman might look like. So in light of all this and a, an attempt to offer a conclusion, I want to return to the question that I asked at the beginning of this talk. What happens when religion and Muslim identity are not used as a counter to political liberalism and democracies in the ways that we've come to think, in the ways that we've come to theorize throughout canons of social theory of anthropology in particular? I believe it's too quick and too dismissive to merely articulate Rawa, Joya, Hambasagi as liberalized versions of Islamic or Muslim identity. After hearing the voices of these political platforms, you might even be wondering why Islam is a pertinent or primary frame to the ways in which Afghan leftists construct their political discourse. Are the evocations of Islam and Muslim identity just facets of multicultural tolerance narratives? Again, I would say quite not, uh, not quite. <laughs> For Afghan feminists, secularism offers an antithesis to the destructive power of Islamic politics. But in this relationship, it's Islamic cosmology and Muslim identity that rearticulate secularism in their own image. What I hope to leave you with is a story based on far more than just opposites. For to frame it as such, would be to fall back once again on vocabularies with which we are all too familiar. Instead, I'm asking us to be open to and to imagine unfamiliarity with the understanding that in doing so, we imagine from a particular place and at a particular point in time as has been taught to us by our feminist theorists. I'll also return to the contemporary political paradox I set up at the beginning of this talk. In the case of right-wing populism I mentioned earlier, liberalism being is being challenged from within the heart of where we might imagine it to most flourish. And in the case of Rawa, Hambas Sagi, and Joya, we have some of liberalism's staunchest supporters from where we might imagine a fundamentalism that's very regressive. I often find myself wondering whether we're lost somewhere in the middle of the end of liberalism. In my more hopeful moments, I think we are. But if so, what comes next? That's all I have for you today. And I'd be happy to um, hear comments and questions that anyone might have. Well, thank you, Shireen, for a very interesting talk and sharing your uh, research uh, with us. Um, I see there's one question, but I. I thought maybe you could elaborate more on the role of uh, Islam or an Islamic identity in structuring um, feminism. That's very generalized, of course, uh, in Afghanistan. But I, but I wonder um, what, how, how would you sort of frame that, that issue um, in the context of, of Afghan feminism in, in particular. 
Yeah, so it's a complex um, question because uh, the ways that Islam is used and articulated, it certainly is, and it's certainly a pertinent feature of these political movements. However, the ways that they articulate themselves change entirely based on audience and who they're speaking to. So I focused on the case of Rawa mostly because I think that they're a great embodiment of the kinds of contradictions that we find or expect to find in um, political actors. So. For example, you know, Rawa has is very well versed in the discourses of, you know, of, of feminist empowerment that really originate from, in, in many cases, a certain type of feminism that comes to be very US centric, very North, North American and European centric. And, um, and I think what's interesting about them is that they don't reject this. Um, they do adopt um, dispositions of it which I believe have to do with their kind of secularist stance that, you know, to have a feminism, what is the relationship of Islam and Islamic doctrine in Muslim practice to feminism? And so here you kind of see the absence of Muslim identity in these discourses, which is extremely, you know, um, kind of to quote uh, Avery Gordon in Ghostly Matters, you know, it's like, the absence also speaks to a certain presence of something. Why is that absent there when in all of their, um, you know, and these are secret and covert, um, you know, uh, activities that they do. So it is hard to find like concrete information and kind of day-to-day -day visualization of what their work is. However, that being said, they work in you know, a Muslim, high, extremely Muslim and Islamic context. And that is a discourse that then becomes used and articulated alongside feminism in a way that we don't see on the public stage. So it's interesting because that absence that they have kind of mirrors this private relegation, but that's also meant for a different kind of gaze. Does that start to answer it? Yeah. Um, and then I had, there are two, two questions in the Q&A box, but I, I had a second question and uh, I don't know whether um, this is part of your work, but I, but I was just wondering about uh, feminism in, in places like Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan, um, and whether or not some of, some of these voices, Afghan voices resonated or whether there was a, a kind of cross border uh, mobilization or or or, uh, or whether or not the, the Soviet uh, framework uh, really kind of uh, made for a very hot border, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why I spent a lot of time really framing the Bandung conference was kind of to to give the like historical roots of what is actually a very transnationalist movement of any sort of moderate to leftist Afghan politics. I mean, we do have the case of Afghanistan that's an extremely war-torn country with a, lo a long history of political instability and violence. Do I think that it's only defined by that? No, but then that does bring into play the, the role of diaspora and kind of the constitution of a nation from afar. And the only ways that these movements um, circulate and gain power and political momentum are ironically from outside of the very country itself. That's where you find like some of the staunchest supporters and political organizers that, you know, live even in the United States. But absolutely, you know, in Tajikistan, there's a huge diaspora um, of Afghans. Same thing with Iran. And so I say that the way that these things happen, first of all, you know, members of the diaspora have voting rights. Second of all, um, first of all, they have voting rights. And second of all, um, yeah, there's not, there's, there's a garnered sense of, you know, as we know in socialism and communism of, of transnational solidarity. And so there is this sense of placing political movements within these kind of broader currents, which I think is very well illustrated by the historical, um, you know, example of the Bandung conference that of course we see today. So absolutely, yeah. And Afghanistan is a really interesting place because in terms of the, the ways that political movements are um, articulated and circulated, um, 
you know, it falls in between, we were talking about this earlier, so many different geopolitical categories. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan is Central Asia. Afghanistan is the Middle East. Afghanistan shares histories of South Asia. Um, and so, you know, not only like nationalist movements, but the, the influences and the things that these movements are responding to are such a confluence of so many different spaces and so many different geopolitics. Um, the first question was, what do you think about the three female journalists recently killed in Afghanistan? Are any female journalists safe in Afghanistan? I mean, safe is a relative word. Um, <laughs> I uh, remember trying to decide if it was going to be possible for me to do field work in Afghanistan. I know actually many people that have and have done so successfully for your ethnography in Afghanistan. Um, what do I think? I mean, I think that we, I, do, is it a dangerous place, quote unquote? Yes. I decided that I didn't want to do field work for the purposes of my family's anxiety in a place where things were categorized as green zone. You know, I was like, okay, well, if green zone means safe, like that kind of scares me a little bit, especially as an, I am an Afghan woman, but you know, I was raised here in the United States. I speak daddy, but I'm sure that I would be sticking out like a sore thumb. So are there security concerns? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to deny that. That being said, I know a lot of people that live in Afghanistan that live peacefully and kind of just the way that we have to think critically about the ways that like crime and violence are, you know, reported in the United States. We have to give that to, you know, other places as well, where Afghanistan is not only defined by that. And these types of violence have patterns um, and they have precedents, um, but also the ways that we hear about them are very particular and cast through very political lens. So um, that would be my answer. Um, then there was a second one, a little bit in the same framework. Mm -hmm. how, how do these women stay alive and yet stay active in their, in their movements? Well, I think that, oh, did I, yeah, I think that pairs exactly with the previous question of, you know, like, of course we hear on the news, I mean, that's the only thing that's being reported really in Afghanistan is, um, you know, the killings, the, the violence, and that's not to say that that stuff is not going on. However, there's a lot more that's going on. Like a whole place can't be defined only by these kind of spectacular moments and like hor horrible narratives of things that are happening. I'm not you know, in support of any of that. But that being said, I think it just goes to show that the possibilities of, of politics are far beyond what we can even imagine because of the kinds of political discourses that we are fed and that we hear and that we understand is that we're not actually understanding a place like Afghanistan in Central Asia through its own terms if we only hear about these particular instances. And, you know, it's, it's also, a, um, you know, been, talked about in, in scholarship of like, you know, the kind of justification narratives um, of, of, you know, interventionism of, you know, what I talked a little bit about of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights kind of enacting a certain type of international sovereignty. And how does that get um, authorized? How is that deemed morally acceptable? Well, you know, by hearing these kinds of stories that we hear, which are horrible. Um, but I would really push to, um, to point out that these people and these women are alive. They are actively um, participating in political movements. Therefore, it is 100% a possibility and reality that people are living. And that happens alongside everything else that we hear. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the centrality of, of, of the victim, the female victim, you know, um, in the war on terror, um, I, I think it, it, it has, it has allowed for a lot of policies <laughs> to be enacted on Afghanistan and in Afghanistan, right? Um, while at the same time also, uh, kind of silencing what voices there are <laughs> in a way, you know, uh, where, where you don't get to hear, um, Afghan women talk about uh, their, as you said in your title, their destiny and their and their country and what they what they see as its as its future. Um, mm -hmm. 
So, oh, there are a couple yeah. of others. Uh, <laughs> are most of the female activists married? If so, are their husbands supported supportive mm. of their dangerous <laughs> efforts? I don't know. <laughs> to be totally honest, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that, uh, I would assume that their family is supportive and sometimes they're not, you know, it's the kind of question that's really extremely difficult to answer and in a highly individualized question. So I'm not sure. And then there is, how are Afghan women in the diaspora interacting with politics in Afghanistan mm. today? Yeah. Part of your research. Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's actually pretty politicized. So there's a lot of activism in the Afghan diaspora and there's actually a lot of political figures that live in the diaspora. There's like a huge contingent, at least there used to be in Germany. Um, there are many people that are political figures that live in the United States, as we know, including, you know, former and now current presidents and administrations in Afghanistan. Um, so there is a lot of activism. However, it's very polarized because of the history of migration in the country and uh, emigration um, in the country. When did people move? Um, what was your like class status when you moved out of the country? You know, people, Afghans are very weary at this point of, you know, external and outside influence. And so even within the Afghan diaspora itself, you know, we think of like Muslims living in a minority context as a sort of um, homogenous category. And at least, you know, I can speak for the case of Afghans, although this applies far beyond, is actually it's a very, um, it's a very unhomogeneous, very diverse group that is not easy to characterize. You know, there are kind of the upper class Afghans that moved um, in the 70s and the 80s. And there is a totally different story of immigration that comes after the war on terror. And so I would say that the ways that this circulates in the diaspora has to do exactly with that history of it's not that um, movements don't garner support, but there tends to be a lot of polarization between who represents like truly insider versus outsider kinds of values. And this being a super important um, aspect of how and why certain political platforms gain the recognition that they do. So for example, Rawa has gotten um, a lot of resistance for its um, you know, collaboration and and using of Western media outlets and political org organizations for its um, for its political activities. That being said, and I didn't talk so much about Hambas Sagi, but Hambas Sagi is another organization that does receive support across the diaspora. There are Afghans that vote for Hambas Sagi. Um, however, it's you know hardly anything published in English. Um, it has a much more kind of internalist enclosed narrative. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my answer. It's a little complex. <laughs> and then um, I think this was a little bit what I was after too. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Can you elaborate a little bit about collaborations between feminists across Central Asia, between Rawa and other organizations in Central Asia, for example? Well, I have to admit here that this is not my area of specialty, so I'm not very familiar with other feminist organizations in Central Asia specifically. Also because um, my answer to this would also be, it's not that Rawa doesn't collaborate with other feminist organizations that might be considered like post-colonial feminists. However, they have very strong ties with um, North American political organizations. So they do much less work in Central Asia. And unfortunately, the ways that you see them collaborating are actually in the United States. You know, they give speaking tours at universities and things like that. So yeah, less, less collaboration across Central Asia with Rawa specifically. And then of the movements that I know of, at least, um, again, they tend to be very internalist and very, um, not that they're not receiving, um, you know, collaboration. However, they're very focused internally on the politics of Afghanistan um, itself. Uh, that being said, I think that there's a lot of sharing that goes on in terms of sharing a Soviet inspired history, but I can't really speak to particular collaborations or organizations. I would love to know about it. 
And then we have the last question, which is actually, uh, wait, that wasn't the last question. <laughs> um, I thought it was the last question. Can you gesture in the direction of what, in your most optimistic moments, you see replacing liberalism on the geopolitical stage? I see you, Carol. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> hmm, that's a good question. Uh, obviously, there should be no one answer. Um, so my opinion is my own, and I hope that there are many other opinions and visions to this. Um, what do I think? Honestly, I get a lot of flack um, from, from people, from Marxists, from leftists, because I tend to be a little bit of a reformationist. Um, I tend to see things not as, you know, kind of being grown from the crumbled masses of what came before it, but really when we start to see stretching, um, stretching of concepts that are familiar to us that become unfamiliar. So what, uh, uh, beyond liberalism, I mean, I think that it's an impossible, it's an impossible question to answer, but it's a really fun one to think about. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure. I think that in my lifetime, what I hope to see is is a sort of expansiveness, but something beyond what the political categories that we use um, define in our everyday lives and our existence. So kind of a kind of a reform. Sorry, I have to say it. That's how I feel. <laughs> how will current outcome of US Taliban talks have its effects on the activities of Rawa? The activity uh, of Rawa, yeah. In case the central government's authority gets restricted only to a certain limited urban centers, as it appears to be the case, especially in the Pakhtun areas. Yeah. Well, I mean, this has been the problem of Afghanistan since it became a nation state. I mean, Afghanistan is an extremely diverse and segregated place. It's also a very racialized society. Um, a lot of people that don't know much about it are surprised to find um, that there's actually various ethnic groups that are still very, yeah, live in, in very particular places and have very particular customs and political beliefs and even languages. Um, I think that in the case of Rawa, I mean, I think that everyone's just going to throw a party whenever the U.S. decides to um, exit Afghanistan. So the peace talks with the Taliban, no one's happy about that. No one, you know, supports that. No one being, you know, kind of moderate and leftist and, you know, more aspirational political platforms. I think that this is what everyone has been waiting for. And unfortunately, you know, like it signals, I think for a lot of people are, are excited because it sort of signals an American defeat, which is what Afghans have been hoping for for the last, you know, 20 years now. Um, however, that being said, you know, the whole thing, oh, peace talks with the Taliban is also kind of a victorious narrative that's being played by the US. So I wouldn't say that Rawa necessarily um, will stop any of its, I think it'll continue. And um, I think that this actually kind of furthers the platform and the work of Rawa in that they're, they've really just been hoping for an independent Afghanistan for a very long time. And so, you know, their political discourses and activism can focus less on this anti-occupation and more on creating, you know, building what they see as their own destiny. Um, I'm interested in the idea of taking on a different identity based on the audience. How do you imagine the political groups you research would share their message with someone like you, a young femme Afghan American academic? <laughs> Camila! <laughs> <laughs> oh, how do I imagine political groups I research would share? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm not sure if they would like me. <laughs> um, I think that you know, there's a lot, again, to be said about, well, you know, as we all know, of carrying different, different identities, it's completely, um, 
it's something that can be can seem completely contradictory and again this like reckons back to a conversation that we had over lunch today but something that we might you know it might appear to us as being a contradiction of holding these various identities that seem to confront each other or that we can't even have these various identities existing in the same place um, at the same time, and yet we do. Um, so, you know, I could talk about myself, um, but also, I mean, this applies to, to political figures like Rawa, um, who, you know, are, they adopt the things that they like and they reject the things that they don't. And I mean, it's a, in some ways a kind of simplistic answer, but at the end of the day, I mean, this is this is how political life unfolds, right? We don't um, we expect there to be contradictions sometimes where there aren't, or sometimes there are contradictions that are resolved just in the very processes of living our everyday lives, um, which means articulating different you know aspects of who we are. Of course, I don't talk like this, you know, to my friends and family, and then of course to my family, there's a different kind of disposition that I have as you know a woman in in a Muslim them practicing family, but these are not, um, it's taken me a long time to, to think about these things not as contradictions, um, to allow myself the space of inhabiting, you know, multiple political categories and that not being problematic, so. What does the revolutionary in Rawa refer to and what are its meanings over time in the context of Soviet and post-colonial movements and moments? Oh my God, I know these people are asking these questions are so brilliant. Um, hmm. Well, I had a very, um, very, very, hi Shakira, um, very, very interesting conversation about, do I believe that there could be a revolutionary Islam? Um, I don't consider myself a total expert on this, maybe quite yet, but I will speak to um, some of the stuff that I do know. What does revolutionary refer to? I mean, I think that it started with very communist roots and very Marxist inflections of what uh, revolutionary means. So, you know, um, before there was like the Soviet kind of hegemony, and actually this was something I wanted to address of the, the question of the urban centers and the central government and the scope of that, you know, Revolutionary started out in the 70s as being something, yes, that was Marxist, but that also connotated a strong centralist state, that there would be social reforms for equity, um, kind of the typical things that we think of in Marxism. Um, there was also the hope that this revolutionary would be an expansive government could incorporate the kind of um, more rural and segregated parts of the population that could actually have scope and reach beyond just the center of Kabul. Um, clearly that's something that never came to be and has always been a, a, a quest in Afghan politics. Um, and what does it mean now? I mean, I think that revolutionary now, I mean, I still think that they're, they're very Marxist. Um, I think that they are very communist. However, I think that revolutionary now um, has gone beyond just what we think of as Marxism. And actually, I'm really interested in, I believe, you know, Rawa is a good example of articulating maybe what a communism post-Marxism looks like. What is a non-Marxist communism? And so I think that that's, they are defining. And again, this comes back to what do I think could come beyond liberalism? Well, you know, what a revolutionary type of socialism that's not Marxist, but something else that forms out of, you know, different political context and a different political vocabulary. So I think that revolutionary now means anti-imperial, but still very socialist. Social reproduction, feminine, we're gonna take the last two. Okay. Uh, so no, don't type any more questions. <laughs> Social reproduction feminists in Latin America and beyond have recently rallied mass movements against femicide and the exploitation of feminized reproductive labor. Do Afghan feminist movements share elements of that approach or do they face particular challenges to that strategy in their context? Yeah, that's such a good question, Heike. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah, Rawa, um, Rawa, they, so Rawa is less, um, you know, invested in the questions of femicide per se. I don't think that they really use that discourse um, or that vocabulary. However, that being said, they are um, very, very vocal of the cost of life um, that the U.S. occupation 
has um, imposed on Afghan civilians and in particular women, and they are very vocal. I mean, you, if you go to their website or look at any videos, they're also extremely explicit in exposing this violence. So it's a lot of, you know, a lot of photos and, and imagery that's very hard to look at, but that is propaganda that is specifically posed at this paradox of, you know, the US has intervened in Afghanistan supposedly for the rights of women and to better the quality of life of women. And however, we have, you know, so many women dying at the hands of this military occupation. Not only that, are we asking what the women of Afghanistan even want? Is this what we want? Do we want an American democracy? So, um, yeah, I, they, they do, they are very inspired by different feminist movements. I mean, across Latin America, they've expressed support for such movements for sure in, in public um, discourses, but um, yeah, I would say that their uh, kind of staunch activism is against US occupation right now and the violences that um, ensued from it. So the last question from Marissa, is there something post-Soviet going on with discourses of quote, human rights here? State as either meeting or not meeting requirements, fulfilling human rights or needs as well as what sounds like more American-based ones. Is this another distinction that could cut across liberalism slash, you know, fundamentalism? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, that was, you know, kind of uh, something that I tried to develop and draw out in the talk. I mean, the question of um, the human, the question of the individual and the question of rights are so fundamental to liberalism but they are fundamental to also communism, to post-Soviet communism. They're fundamental to questions of Islam and Islamic governance. And so actually, um, you know, this is like a perfect kind of, uh, exactly like what you're saying, cross-cutting category um, that exists and is articulated and yet to be understood um, through different you know, vocabularies. This is where it becomes very difficult to have anything like a kind of cross-cultural critique or understanding because things get articulated through different lenses. That being said, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try. And I do think that the discourse of human rights because of the kind of primacy that it holds and the promises of freedom is a very good one um, to use to cut across these different um, kind of frameworks, so. Yes, I agree. Yes. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> we're going to end uh, the event. Uh, and I want to just thank Shireen for a wonderful talk. And um, mm -hmm. you've given us a lot of food for thought. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is really fun. Um, it's great that you joined our group. And I yeah. look forward to, to future events and, and gatherings, hopefully in person at some point. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I hope so. <laughs> thank you so All much. All right. <laughs> and thank you to the audience who yes. um, chimed in at the end with a number of very interesting questions. On, I think we had a, a good discussion there yes. at the end as well. So I hope to see you at future events. And thank you all for, for joining us today. Bye, everyone.